This is a Bulldog Radio Podcast. The Ferris State Bulldogs have upset the nation's number two ranked team. Wide open! Taylor is going to take this one to the house! Touchdown Bulldogs! It's the MVSP Season 4, Episode 53. Cannot wait to get it into it with you guys. Great episode we got on deck for you as well. Fair State Sports Report, as always. Masters Final, and as well as the NBA Playoffs. A lot of what we talked about last time, not going to lie, but as we know, the sports world is always changing, so we always got new stuff to talk about. But before we get into that, Brand, who else do we have coming on the show? We have a special guest, one that we've tried to get on for a long time, and obviously he's a very busy man, especially in the height of season right now. Head coach Sam Stark of Ferris State Golf stopped by Ooh. to talk about the season so far, embracing the Michigan elements. You know, it's supposed to be 70 degrees this week, Joe. Like That's all huge. week. Oh my gosh. What the heck is going on? Mother Nature. Seasonal depression is out the window, baby. I, I tell you, this is my philosophy on weather. Now, we'll get to sports, obviously, later on in the show. There's like the whole 50 states, obviously. And Mother Nature has, you know, just, I can imagine these buckets of just obviously... The amount of weather elements, right? Uh-huh. Obviously, when you get out west, obviously, they're getting the heat. They're getting the sun. They're getting the nice weather, yeah. Yeah, you go up into the north northwest, obviously, they're getting the rain. Obviously, if you go up north, they're getting the cold. If you're going down uh, southeast, you're getting a little bit of that warmth, a little bit of the rain there, too. Northeast, you get a little bit of the cold, a little bit of the rain. Then Michigan just gets whatever's left over in the bucket at after all the other states get their appropriate corresponding weather elements. We just yeah. get the rest. Like we'll have <laughs> hail in one day and then the next day we'll just have perfectly sunny skies. Then there'll be a tornado though. in the afternoon. Like we just get the all the leftovers. The weather playlist is put on shuffle is really what it is. There's really there's really <laughs> yes. no guessing of what it's gonna be. But without further ado, Brandon, let's swing it to the interview. Now joining us in studio, head Ferris State golf coach Sam Stark stopped by. Coach, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, fellas. Really appreciate it. Coach Stark, thank you so much for coming on. First question for you. Big weekend last weekend with the Bill Blazer Memorial. Women's are also still in action. I mean, talk about how the teams have been doing so far, as well as uh, what you liked from last weekend from the boys. It's been a steady season for both. Um, Ladies are playing as we speak. This is getting recorded on, what day is it? Monday. Monday. Today's Monday. So they're in St. Louis, Missouri right now. Um, Still competing. Started the day in second place. Eight shots behind Grand Valley. Um, I'll start with them just cause I started talking about them, but, um, very, very solid season, a lot of depth on that side, more so than we've had in the past. Um, so able to compete with those better teams in the region, you know, you talk about Grand Valley and, um, a team that's hosting this tournament this week, which was Missouri St. Louis. That's another one where they've been the standard in the region for a while. And we're actually able to beat Grand Valley by one single shot. Uh, a couple of weeks ago at Finley's tournament. So that was just showed us we're doing the right things. You know, we're moving in the right direction, um, coming off regional appearance last season. And then this year, really comfortably inside um, the top, really the top six in the regional rankings. So um, women's college golf is interesting because it's super stratified. You have maybe your top 15 teams, um, which are usually sizably better than, than the rest. You have maybe 15 through 50, and then you have everybody else. Um, So we're slowly working our way out of that, everybody else into that next stepping stone. And that's huge for us, Mm -hmm. you know, just um, that's going to be top five within our region. That's hopefully moving into the top 25 in the country um, and just progressing forward. But they've had a good season. Um, A lot of freshmen in the lineup, which is a good thing. Three freshmen in the lineup this week, actually. Uh, That's the first time we've done that this year. Wow. So uh, it just speaks to the depth, speaks to how hard they work. um, And and they're doing the right things to consistently put themselves in position to win tournaments. So that's the next step. Um, Haven't won one this year. I can't think. My brain's so scrambled. I don't think we've won one this year. Um, I know we won one last year. Do a quick fact check for you. Yeah. yeah. Season yeah. goes by so fast. Yeah, it's just exactly. a blur. It does. Yeah. It's been, uh, it's been between two teams. I think it's been 12 events in the span of about 40 days. So Jeez. goodness gracious. Yeah. It's a bit of a, <laughs> bit of a scrambled egg situation, but um, yeah, ladies have been really steady men. We got out last week for uh, two tournaments. Actually we were in Nashville and then Ohio. Uh, T f- or took fifth in Nashville, T second in Ohio. 
Um, and that'll help us big time. Um, as we head towards the postseason. we're kind of on the bubble of being in the, in the postseason automatically. Um, obviously if we win our conference championship this week, um, that'll put us in with the auto bid. So that's uh, Friday through Sunday near Kalamazoo. And we're just stamped up for that. You know, we got a couple guys playing really well. Uh, Caleb bond has been second, first, second individually his last three tournaments, which is, um, just getting right, you know, getting hot at the right time. I'd say, um, he's another freshman, so he's put in a ton of work. He's been super steady, super mature in his approach. And, um, you know, we've, we've got some depth on that side too, to, to work with, um, finding a fourth and fifth score has been, um, a bit more of a challenge. So this week's important for us with nice weather to get out and set a lineup and, and get some guys, some confidence and keep it rolling into conferences. But, uh, fifth place and second place for them last week was huge for us and a big boost. So we'll see what that does for us regionally. And it's, it's just hard to, uh, to get hot at the right time. And I know Caleb's got that. So we're seeing if he can be contagious with that to the other guys. Absolutely. And you mentioned the depth on both squads has definitely been something noticeable as well as really the first to second round progression, I think has been a big part of this team, being able to play your best golf in that final round and make moves up the leaderboard. Just talk about how that team, especially on both sides, can really get to that course and, and really make those right adjustments to improve your score. But obviously, as we kind of talked on air a little bit, that first round getting a little bit higher really can be the difference between finishing 10th and then finishing in that top three. Yeah, our region is so tight that if you don't take advantage of some opportunities the first day, um, you can create just a little bit of cushion the wrong way, you know, and it's not a ton of shots. You think about team golf is a weird concept for a lot of people because it's, we're typically playing five people counting four scores. And for instance, our first round, um, for the men in Nashville, I believe we're 10 over, um, and in sixth or seventh place, third place was five shots better than that. And every, every stroke matters so much in our region. It's just usually one shot per, per person. So just reiterating the importance of that is huge for both of our teams. Um, and it's, it's once you get into the mode of, okay, I'm not going to compound this mistake with another mistake. That's when you start to play your best golf. And we've been able to do that definitely in second rounds last week for the men. Um, it's just, how do we translate that to the first round? So that's what I'm still noodling on. If, uh, if anybody has suggestions, I have to <laughs> on my own. but, um, it's, it's tough to come out of the gates and you're coming off a practice round and you're feeling good and get out there and it's, the margins are, are so slim. Um, so it's, it's about mis mistake avoidance and compounding mistakes and well, I guess not compounding mistakes and just trying to, uh, to learn from the first day. So we just got to get off to a little bit hotter starts, but been really good, good work by the guys. Um, Good work by the ladies too. Last couple of weeks getting out, um, and you know we just say win the day, and the guys did that the last two times out. So not much more I can ask for as a coach. Yeah, social media posts. We're looking for comments now. We need suggestions <laughs> for Coach Dark Squad. <laughs> Absolutely, and especially with the season starting in early March. I mean, the weather to play golf is so spotty, and it's usually with snow and at the start of the season. I mean, how does that go with coaching to be able to just get people ready for being able to play in weather that is terrible to play golf and when it's so cold yeah we've had some tough uh tough days 40 degrees 35 degrees wind rain frost delays it's uh it kind of goes with golf in the midwest and it doesn't matter how far south you get you inevitably kind of bring the weather with you you know you could be you could be 70 degrees one day for a practice round the next day is 40 <laughs> um so it, it always seems to happen for us so it's just mentally getting prepared for that before we leave trying to put us in some adverse situations in practice to where it's it's just another day and um i would say our our athletes play enough in bad weather to where they're fairly unfazed by it they know what they're signing up for it's interesting to see some of the newcomers when they're like you know high school is either for michigan women it's in um it's in the fall for the men it's in the spring so the men's players are a bit more used to that um but there's still both that fall and spring season component for us um that it's, it's a really long season. It's a grind. So you're going to see every single bit of weather conditions you can. I mean, this weekend at conference is supposed to be 75 degrees last year. It was a real feel of 29 degrees when they <laughs> teed off against Jeez. Grand Valley in the metal match play semifinals. So, um, you just gotta be adaptable. You gotta be prepared. You gotta have all the right gear, you know, 
Um, so, you know, if I can do my job and equip us both mentally and literally with the right gear, uh, that's what I'm there for, you know, big time. as much as the golf side of it's important, it's, mm-hmm. it's the comfort factor, you know, it's, are you comfortable in these, in these situations because you've been in them before or because you're well equipped for them. So, mm-hmm. um, that's a huge piece of it that I think, uh, if you overlook you're you're going to be on the wrong side of the draw there. Sure. Yeah. And for sure, for with your coaching journey, obviously you once were a bulldog, competed in the bulldog uniform back mm-hmm. in the day. And then obviously doing going up the coaching tree, U of Indy, Alderson Broadus, Coker, now back here. Uh, just talk about that experience, really kind of learning from that student athlete's perspective and competing in a lot of these tournaments, then kind of going through that coaching experience now to here and where you can apply that knowledge and really give your team the best opportunity to succeed. Yeah, it's been great because um, you see a lot of the same courses, a lot of the same people, a lot of the same coaches in the same, in the same spots. So that's the fun piece of it for me. And it's taking what I've learned from those various places. I mean, three very distinct different spots, UND, um, all this from Broadus in West Virginia and Coker in South Carolina. So, um, pretty much three different regions and a UND is a little closer to home, but, um, three distinct regions, the Midwest, the East, and then the South. A lot of different styles of golf, a lot of different lineups that you're going to see in the South. You're going to see a ton of internationals um, out East. It's not as difficult to make the postseason, right? You want to push people to compete a little harder. Um, no offense to the East region. If anyone from the East region is is listening. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, it's true. So, and then just kind of going off my own experience here, you do get into some adverse weather situations. Um, you get into just battling out with a lot of really good teams. Um, the region hasn't changed much over the years. You know, it's the same teams really competing hard for the postseason. Um, but I will say it's gotten a lot tighter over the years. Um, since I played, I played 2010 to 2015 and you could count on maybe four or five teams every time that were going to go out and compete hard and, and try to win. And now it's eight to 10, right. To where everyone's gotten better. Everyone's hitting the ball further. Everyone's got the technology everyone's got the right equipment. People are putting more resources into golf. There's more athletes playing golf instead of other sports in high school. So, um, you know, these guys would, would kick my butt if I tried to play out there. (laughs) But I think the piece that's important that I can bring to the table is just, um, you know, I'm, I'm not as athletic as them. I'm not as gifted as them, but if I can try to put my golf brain into theirs, that's where the difference is. Right. Um, cause they're going to, do some things that are going to amaze me, both good and bad. You know, they're just physically capable of doing so many incredible things out there on both sides, uh, both men and women. But, you know, if, if we're smart and we plot our way around the golf course the way we should and respect the golf course the way we should, that's where we're going to have success. That's brought our best rounds this season. Yeah, absolutely. And especially you're talking about the technology that's been going into golf. I and mean, we got the indoor golf simulators mm-hmm. at Khaki. It's been, it's one of the, uh, best centers for golf in the country. I mean, what's that for you guys, especially when you get those winter months where you can't go outside, but you got the simulators right there. I mean, how uh, special is that for you guys to be able to practice on those? It's huge. I mean, we have a great relationship with Khaki and with, with the PGM program itself. Um, So that's kind of a joint venture between the three of us. Um, And not only do we have four track man bays upstairs and those probably run, God, I'd hate to see retail on those, but um, (laughs) it's it's certainly a perk, you know, track man's themselves about 25 K a piece. So yeah, um, (laughs) to be able to access that pretty much anytime we want uh, for our student athletes is, is massive. You combine that with something like the cap that just opened, um, you know, new, new center for athletic performance, $15 million weight room and team rooms and, all the things that success should bring. Right. Um, and we certainly have had a lot of success in our golf program and in athletics, uh, the last few years, you know, it's, it's a huge training tool. It's a huge recruiting tool for us. So, um, very fortunate to have those, especially in the winter months. I know last season we didn't get outside until right around this time. Um, and so we've been lucky last few weeks to get outside a little bit. Um, cat keys opening on Wednesday actually. So, um, it'll be right before conferences, but it'll be, you know, hopefully beyond conferences in the postseason play, um, just right there on campus. And, but if we do want to pop inside and get some numbers on that nice technology, it's still there for us. Yeah. Awesome. 
Yeah. And absolutely. When you mentioned the postseason coming up, what are some of those things you guys have been working on in practice this week, especially now once the tournaments will come to an end for a lot of these teams tomorrow? Uh, what are some of those things you were hoping to see the team improve upon and uh, really just fine tune before we get into GLIAC and obviously the East Regional coming up? There's been a lot of positives in terms of grit um, in those second rounds, like we touched on from, or I guess, final rounds. Sometimes it's the second round, sometimes it's the third round. But it's been extremely positive the way both teams have fought. Um, for instance, our our men this last week in Ohio, I believe were in sixth place most of the day. Ended up tied second and actually had a putt to tie Wayne State for first. And it, it all happened so fast, I didn't even know it. Um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with PJ Tour, Live Golf, that whole debate right now. But it <laughs> felt like a Live Golf event because it was a shotgun start. And so... Um, it was three guys finishing birdie and then with an eagle putt, which turned into a birdie and then another birdie putt that brought us to, to 10 over. Um, so I, I think there's a lesson in that of just staying in it because there can be days that as a player, you might consider bad, but it's exactly what your team needs is to hang in there. That's the kind of the wild card of team golf is how much stick to do you have, right? And uh, so on the men's side, that's been great to see the last couple of weeks. The women's side, um, in our best field of the, of the year at Finley, we played, it's a unique format. So you play all five of your own players in one group. Really? Yep. Interesting. So 54 huh. holes of that. Originally started because of COVID, just they didn't want oh. intermingling in that. Mm, and then yeah. they just stuck with the format. So on the surface, a little bit odd. Um, but if you stay positive and your attitude's really good and you can feed off each other, that's when Winter. it starts to pay dividends. Mm -hmm. And our ladies did that really well. Our men played in the same format, did a really good job of that too the next week. But the ladies um, were struggling a little bit, hit a wall at about 48 holes, 47 holes into a 54-hole event um, and played their last seven holes even as a team, um, which was outstanding. So um, it, it's just trying to take that, bottle it up, and turn it into practice, whether it's course management, whether it's um, – applying pressure. It's really my job is to make practice as pressure filled as possible, right? Um, just to create those performance moments for our team. So the more I can do that, the more I can draw from the experiences we've had this season, um, the better off we're going to be. But it's been a really, um, I guess, well-tailored spring towards that just because there's been so many of those pressure moments that we've performed well in. Um, ironically, it's, it's been getting lax at the beginning of tournaments where we need to kind of treat it like the end of a tournament. And so that's, that's the key to unlock really, 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 really good golf and be one of the best teams in the region on both sides is how do we create that atmosphere all the time? Right. Um, and that's what we're looking to do this week. So we'll, we'll be doing that today at, at Khaki today, tomorrow, Wednesday, and then get on the road Thursday for the, for the gentlemen and then ladies next week with conferences. Awesome. And especially since you're talking about those different formats of tournaments, do you have a, like a favorite or just a least favorite of like how those tournaments are set up about like you like the shotgun starts or you like uh, without all five together? What's that kind of like? It's interesting. I like the shotgun start um, just because it gives you an opportunity to not finish on the same part of the golf course as everyone else. Mm -hmm. For instance, this last week, if we would have finished on three holes prior, those are the toughest three holes on the course. However, we got out in front of the toughest holes on the course we started on those we got those out of the way first we knew we had some holes to score on down the stretch uh postseason play is not like that you know everyone's starting on one or ten uh, with tee times but yeah as, as a coach it's it's fun to go through different formats i wouldn't want to do that one where all five teams play together every tournament <laughs> um but it's super valuable for me as a coach, because I get to see how we manage the golf course all together. Mm -hmm. You know, normally I'm seeing maybe 30 to 35, 40% of everyone's shots. If I'm lucky that one, I'm seeing 100% and it's perfectly right in the middle of our spring so that it's, it's a really good assessment for us. Okay. You know, how are we managing the golf course? How are we managing our emotions? Are we picking each other up? We're we being good teammates. Um, and to credit both groups, they did a fantastic job with that. It's just, as a coach, um, you try to not overstimulate your brain in that moment just because there's so many things you see. It's like, all right, let's pick out a couple points for each person that were really good, a couple that we can work on, take those home. Um, that's a great question. I, I would probably say, 
anytime we can play in a, in a warm environment, 36 holes in one day, like the ladies did yesterday. And then 18, um, that's always fun. Cause it's a gauntlet, you know, it's unique. It's a lot of golf. People don't realize just how much walking it is. Um, I walked 36 and I think I walked like Brandon's going to laugh. Cause he's like, yeah, I did that. That mile this morning, but I wasn't going to mention it, but yeah, no, I, was, I walked, I think 13 miles in one day. And then over the span of the three days, it was, it was just short of a marathon. It was like 25 miles. So, Jeez, dude. um, yeah, it's, it can take a toll on you, you know, and credit to our players. Cause they got that they're missing classes. They probably missed the most class of any team I would say. Um, and also shout out to our professors at Ferris because they do a phenomenal job of, of working with us and not working against us, especially with some of the majors we have. You know, we have some some really high end stuff um, on our team and the deeper you get into those programs, the tougher it gets to miss. But um, yeah, our, our athletes do a great job of just managing all that. I mean, it's it's a lot. If you put the average person through it and then said, oh, by the way, when we get back at two in the morning, you have to go to class at 8 a.m. Um, I don't think they'd be too thrilled. They'd probably be <laughs> yeah. thrilled with the golf part of it, but Everything else is, uh, they do a fantastic job of managing. For sure. One last question for you, coach. Appreciate you coming on the show for us. What's been your favorite thing about being here at Fair State and being a Bulldog? Cut me to the core there, Brandon. <laughs> um, I think the connections you make both as a student, as a student athlete, and now as a coach, um, especially revolving around Fair State golf. I mean, not only do you have a really rich history with the golf program, but you also have the professional golf management program. Regardless of where I'm at in the country, and I've been at four different schools now, um, I've always kept that bulldog head cover on, on my bag. And not only does that open a lot of doors and people take a lot of pride in that, but you would be um, just amazed at how much weight the Fair State name carries, you know, especially with the prominence of our athletics programs the last few years and historically our golf program. Um, just as, as an example, we were able to go to the players championship this year in Florida oh, um, so cool. on That's our cool. spring break trip. And so we're all repping our Ferris gear. Right. And I, you know, you never know what kind of reception you're going to get when you're wearing a certain team's gear. I got stopped probably nine or 10 times. Oh, Ferris state, Michigan. Oh, great, great football, great golf, great, you know, this, that. I'm like, that's, that's pretty awesome to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just continuing to hopefully put our golf programs on the map, right? Um, having pride in being a bulldog, respecting the history of our programs is just so massive for me. It's such an honor to be back here um, in a place I love. And just being back in Big Rapids is cool after experiencing some, some other walks of life, right? Um, this was kind of always the job I wanted and um, hopefully live up to that every day. Uh, I know our teams do, and I know they, they take it seriously and um, they have a lot of pride in what they do, but it's just really cool to be back and it's awesome to be a Bulldog. Coach, thanks so much for coming on and great luck this weekend. Thanks guys. Appreciate you having me. Once again, big thanks to Coach Stark for coming on the show. Always appreciate the coaches, the players, everybody taking time out of their busy schedule uh, to just hang on, hang out, hang on the podcast with us. And it's always a good time. Absolutely. Just to get their insight on how, I mean, especially like the, how the game of golf is played. Obviously, yeah. everybody knows how golf works. Obviously, right. You want the least amount of strokes to get in the holes possible. But especially in the collegiate environment, like it's a whole different ball game. It's a team game as much as an individual game, even though how individualized golf is. And I thought that was really put well uh, from what he would spoke about, especially the team element of, you know, it's not your five strokes away. It's one individual is one stroke away. That's really what I thought I took away from that. I mean, hey, you never know. We, you, when you get out in the links here, hopefully soon, Wednesday, it sounds yeah, like, khaki's Joe. Khaki's opening up, baby. Ooh, Might have to get out there. I'm ready to get to the range. I got to get new grips, though, before, I, before the season starts. Yeah, get a little wear and tear. Yeah, just on a couple of my clubs, not gonna lie. Yeah, I gotta get my dad a new putter grip. His is like getting flaky. It's a yeah, really, it's side, a really old grip. Though. Side note: Before we head to the break, my dad one time was playing with me, and he put his, he was taking his putter out, and he's like, "Yeah, you can go to your ball." So I was like driving, and I took off too early, and then his putter like uh, thing snapped at the top. So he Ooh. he took off. I took, well, I took off like six inches off his putter. So then he was like bent way over trying to put. It was a funny thing. Yeah, I had to I, buy him a new putter after, but. As that's rough. One time when I was hitting in my backyard, when I was a kid, I had my, like I had my smaller set at the time. I was, I had a huge driver head. Right. So of course, naturally oh, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. like, yeah, I can hit two balls at the same time. Then go just as far. I had made a bet Snap to my buddy. 
went about 30 yards straight down in my yard. It was so funny. But then I was like, yeah, now I got to use my fairway wood to drive. Uh, this sucks. That, uh, <laughs> like, that one is unfortunate. Rip. But I, I mean, hey, the ball, one ball did go probably 175, 200 yards. The other one did one not. One ball was smoked. Yeah. I think the driver head might have actually out drove my other second ball but you know it's just fun experiments when you're a kid and now yeah. i have a now i have a decent set yeah, i make got, it work i definitely need a new store. set here soon though yeah we'll have to go wednesday ran wednesday I'm, yeah or we'll whatever day make, i mean we'll have to make it work but i we'll have to make it work yeah go play we'll, 18 or not I'd be, i mean i'd be down for 18 but we'll we'll have to see but anyways no more fooling around we'll, yeah, head, yeah. To, we'll head to the break and get in the fair state sports report right after this And we're back second half of the show. Me and Joe now have our golf plans made up during that commercial <laughs> break. But big thanks as well to Spotify for podcasters for making this platform possible. Formerly known as Anchor has been certainly good to us and the amount of options we have for this show to make it the best for you guys. They do an incredible job and you can get started today as mentioned in the read itself. But anyway, into the Fair Stage Sports Report we go. Might as well start with golf. Seems very Might relevant well. with this episode here, especially when we get to the Masters here later on. Uh, right now, women still in action as mentioned in the interview. Umsel Spring invite right now sitting in second. A pretty good spot overall. Obviously hunting down that trophy here over the next round to close it out. Uh, men's obviously coming off of uh, a big performance in Bill Blazer. Obviously, freshman Caleb Bond, uh, Kalia at Golfer of the Week a week ago, continues his tear right now. Uh, but especially the team making a huge comeback there um, over that second round to finish second. I mean, that's just showing you that this team is gritty. And that's the biggest word that I think Coach Stark mentioned. I think it's reigning true is this team knows how to improve round one to round two. And they can do some real damage if they can come out and put some hammer down in round one, especially going in the postseason against some really, really good golf teams that we have here in the GLIAC Conference. Yeah, that's true. And the thing, too, especially if you look at the Bill Blazer uh, Memorial, I mean, you get to have a chance to play really well against a lot of GLIAC teams, which I think is big to be able to see where you're at at this point in the season. You only got, you know, what, two, three more weekends until the end of the season, pretty much? It's literally, if you're, if you're, like, I mean, for the men, it's, this week is GLIACs, next week is regionals. Like. Yeah, so you're you're really on the horse right now to be able to make a late season push, and especially when you're able to see how well you're able to play against a lot of these conference opponents. It's, it's a real big confidence booster as well, especially when you have that big uh, surge in late of that of in late of that tournament to get you all the way up to second. And, I mean, that's a really cool part. I never really thought about that, too, especially when we were talking about uh, with Coach Stark is, like, you're not really one stroke away as a team or, you know, five strokes or whatever. You're one stroke away as an individual. And I think especially when you see how well we were able to play, uh, especially with that pressure, tying second there, one run stroke off of that first place spot to maybe go into a playoff or something like that. I think that's a really solid, uh, really solid show out for the boys. Yes, I do correct myself that it is actually back in May will be the the regionals, but still Gleax coming up this weekend. That's the most prominent issue. And of course, that'll be the one they're focused on. But I mean, yeah, you looked across the board. Uh, I'll obviously see a lot of really good teams in this tournament. Um, pretty deep field overall. A lot of teams that we had seen before. Uh, obviously, Wayne State as well as Davenport right at the top of the leaderboard. The ones that we were fighting with um, that whole tournament. I mean, it's kind of crazy that all three teams were within a stroke of each other at the top. Top, uh, being able to beat other teams along the way, like Ohio Dominican, um, as well as Cedarville. A lot of teams that we've faced in regional competitions across many different sports, a couple other GLIAC teams in there as well. Um, but I think you really just saw the the overall, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it uh the word the word dominance comes to mind, but I think when you look at some of the, I mean, kind of Coach Stark mentioned those tier levels, you know, obviously the first 15, then the 15 to 50, and then obviously the rest. The teams that are fifth, the top 15 come out with an absolute huge performance right out of the gate, and then they can hold that the way through. And I think, obviously, when you look at, especially us in Davenport, we tied for second in this, obviously. We've both finished at a 586, tied for second, but we were the ones that improved six strokes comparison to they went down 10 strokes from round one to round two, but Davenport had that good first round by eight strokes by us that made up the tie difference to get them into second. So would you rather want that hot round in that last round, that final round? Absolutely. But when it comes down to it, 
when you can start out a little bit hotter in that first round, if you can take two strokes from that first round and then you can make those improvements, we beat Wayne State. That's the mm-hmm. difference, right? That's all this team is missing, right? Because we have the depth, right? Caleb Bond's been incredible individually for this team leading the way. Zach Corner, Adam Mastry, as well as Dan Shattuck, as well as Mitchell Guy getting a spot in that starting five. He played pretty well. I think when you see that team's depth, that just that sense, I don't, I want to say it's a sense of urgency. I'm not going to, mm-hmm. I'm not going, I'm not going to go say that, but just that overall first round of play is really the only difference between this team being a GLIAC favorite and being right in the hunt for the chip. I think mm-hmm. that's really the only difference because we have the depth. We have a lot of great depth on this team. And I think that's just really what's made this team so much better uh, over the last couple of years. And obviously it's just, it's a historic program that has won a lot. And I think that's something that can really help us, especially uh, going in on now. Obviously, the weather's going to be nicer. Obviously, uh, conditions are going to be a little bit more stable. So it's going to be a little bit better going in for preparation. But I think this still this team still has a really good shot this weekend. I think some people are probably going to overlook us a little bit. That's fine. You can sleep all you want until we beat you. That's fine. Uh, and I think that's where Coach Shark's team likes to be. And I think that underdog mentality is why they've played really well this season because they've battled through the elements and they put some really good results sure. across the board. Yeah, exactly. And that's one thing that's really going to be showing out as the season progresses and as it goes uh, to these later parts and especially for the women uh, they're in action so far right now it's Monday the 10th for us I think we're going to be able to get this episode out today as well so hopefully you guys can check out uh, the results later on today uh, but so far day one in second place not too bad of a spot right now just behind Grand Valley uh, they're plus 50 and then or yeah 50 and then we're uh, four strokes behind uh, for the soul spot of second place. But there's a lot of solid teams here uh, that have been able to have some success in these past few years, especially, I mean, you know, Grand Valley is the big one that we are really hoping to beat so far. But I mean, with round three going on today, I think we're going to be doing pretty solid and hopefully we can, uh, you know, make some noise. Yeah, absolutely. And you see like individually, this team has the depth as well. They've been playing really well uh, as we sit right now, a couple of them through about five or six holes from their tee time so far. Lena Eldred's one under par right now um, is our top individual. I think she's right now in the position of sixth, assuming that um, that golf stats updated at this very moment here. It's about 1210 as we're recording this here live. But uh, I mean, definitely you see that the, the range of consistency uh, from the women's side, I think it is a really Really, a really crucial part as well. I mean, we were at 11 over, 14 over, 19, 15, and 20. I mean, that's a really close knit spot right there. Uh, mm-hmm. A little bit smaller than smaller than the range of the boys, but uh, I think you see really this team. And I mean, especially looking kind of uh, across the scorecard right now, uh, we're able to really string across a lot of good holes, right? Being able to get in a position where we're making a lot of good shots and we're can really stretching it out. Just mm-hmm. the, getting out of those little funk spots, getting those you know three bogeys in a row. I mean, I know for me, it happens a lot in the game of golf and it's very frustrating, Um, but being able to snap out of that and get some pars under your belt and then really be able to come back and then start to really make those adjustments to get uh, a couple birdies or even get a shot at an eagle. Um, So I think that that's really kind of the spot that we're kind of looking at right now as we look at the score sheet is we're able to really play some consistent golf, just kind of chipping off those strokes, just getting a birdie every now and then to really keep the morale up is really the the biggest difference. And especially with the, uh, the way that we can improve over round two in round one. Uh, I think it's just really get out, start quick, start fast, start hot, and then just really take that improvement and really build upon it from there. It's been consistency for this tournament as well. We've been leading the tournament so far in pars made with 112. Grand Valley is right behind us with 107, but to be able to see that has been really encouraging as well. The par fours and the par fives where the big stick can eat, uh, that's where uh, we've also been playing really consistency, consistently averaging a plus one on a par five. and a, uh, or Sorry, we're plus one so far averaging about 5.03 on the par five. And then uh, 4.39 on the par fours. The par three has been a little bit of a struggle, but I think picking that up in this uh, this round is going to be really solid. And that might be the difference maker to be able to move up into that first place spot. But Grand Valley's also been playing pretty consistently so far this tournament. Absolutely. And I have one little thing to nitpick here for you. Move on over into softball. Let it eat. Why do we not have these stats from these players compiled into statistical lists? What do you mean? Like, on so, you know, side? so like we just went through, like, obviously uh, there's team stats within each tournament of uh, eat number of Eagles, number of birdies per team, par threes, par yeah. four, scoring average, all that sort of stuff. 
and they have obviously these player stats on how they're doing on each hole and stuff like that, which is awesome, by the way. Like this is like I I noticed yeah. it a couple of weeks ago. I was like that this was you a mean, thing. Why and I was is like, it not like we combined? Should, yes, and we should have like you know how every sport has statistics uh, of whether yeah. it's compiled times or whether it's compiled statistics. Like why doesn't golf have that for men's and women's? Like I'm pretty sure I looked on the NCAA site and there wasn't any. I and thought like for who's. Like their average of the year or something? Like, yeah. Like, like are, how like, like how are individuals doing amongst the nation oh, with, like on par threes, on, team? on par fours, oh, on par yeah, fives, yeah. scoring averages, all of those sort of things. Like, why don't we have Does that? have that on there? Uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'm I don't not, think they do. I don't think they, they, don't they don't do. Like, they, like, it would be really cool to have these stats compiled because, like, I don't know how especially well when you have good tournaments, you want to see that being compared with how much you're improving on the leaderboard overall, especially that's what we have rankings and Midwest rankings and regional rankings and national rankings. Um, but I mean, especially individually that can kind of show you like where your strengths and weaknesses are. Now, obviously coaches know that coach dark knows that we can see that kind of, as we go through the recaps, but for some people that don't necessarily follow golf as much as we do all yeah. the actual, um, like I, I don't want to call them actual fans, but the hardcore fans, the hardcore followers that follow every tournament, every shot, every win, every loss, you know, the, the, the whole nine yards. Why doesn't that necessarily have the same thing? Because like you can go to a basketball game and you can look up stats during the game of, oh my gosh, this Ethan Erickson kid can shoot the three ball because he's number one in the nation yeah. in three point percentage. Oh, we can equate that of, man, Fair State really can hammer down the par fours. They're 10th in the country in scoring average on par fours. Like that's the cool part about what statistics are all about is bringing the light of something, whether it's a theme of a team or just this feat that you can really celebrate. And the fact they don't have that, it's kind of it, like, it's kind of disappointing a little bit. And you can have obviously like core stats and stuff like that too. But uh, I think it would just be kind of cool to see that. I'm not sure necessarily if there is a site out there, if there is somebody, please let me know so we can find it. But I have not found one, but I mean, it would be really cool to see how we stack up compared to yeah. a lot of these teams that we might necessarily be below within the regional rankings. And that can be the key of like, okay, we need to focus on par threes a little bit. We need to get those scores down a little bit. We need to work on the irons. We need to work on those tee shots, those short tee shots. NCAA needs to step up a little bit. Yeah, come on, NCAA. There's, Do better, NCAA. You guys kind of stink. I yeah, yeah. We've kind of talked about that over pretty, the last couple of years. Pretty but. poopy, if you ask me. <laughs> that's, that's a great answer. NCAA is... NCAA is not great with a lot. Of, I don't know. I feel like they can do a lot better with a lot of things, but I feel like they don't really pay attention to a lot of the lower, lower uh, sports that bring in stuff. You are absolutely right. Which is, I mean, people can't even argue with me on that one because that's a hundred percent true. Absolutely true. Absolutely, Absolutely true. Anyway, moving over to softball <laughs> now, one. Joe. We Let's got go. some pretty good results over the weekend. Obviously, Friday, uh, some dramatic endings, yeah, uh, certainly wild, in order. Dude. That was a heck you of a ball game. game right? I was there Friday. It was a certainly it's fun a game day. to watch. A yeah. long day. It was a long day. Uh, getting the win, especially in game one, dominant offense right out of the gate, 9 5 win over the Pride. Um, certainly, the next game took a little couple extra innings, obviously it going did. through yeah. 10. Uh, but, I mean, we took advantage. When the yeah. time needed it. The, I missed my Good Friday service because of that game. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> also, happy Easter, everybody. Yeah, happy uh, Easter for all that's tuning in. you guys in. had a great time. But yeah, that one, this weekend, I think, was a tale of two games, if you really look at, or t- tale of two days. Because with Purdue Northwest, this was the first time where like I saw like our bats were just alive. Like We were able to just jump on a lot of things. From one through nine, we were playing really solidly at the plate. We were hitting well. We were aggressive. As well as in the base pass, we were super aggressive as well. And to be able to put up a five spot in the first inning of the first game, that just adds so much momentum. Yeah, we gave up, I think it was what, four? Uh, that bottom of the bottom of the ninth, or the, not the bottom of the ninth, the bottom of the first as well. So, or top of the second? I can't remember how that works. <laughs> I, I played baseball my whole life, and I get mixed up with top, bottom, and all that how stuff. How do but, innings work? We don't know. We played really solidly for the first part of the game, putting up a lot of runs, and then it was kind of stagnant all throughout, and then being able to uh, get another insurance run in the sixth and shut it out in the seventh was a huge thing. I mean, but if you look at it, I mean, Josie Prince played really well. She got a run off a, off a I think it was a sacrifice fly, wasn't it? Uh, near the end of the game, or sorry, in that uh, in that second inning to kind of have that momentum back in our way. And then also uh, Jay and Joseph having that. Was it Jaden or Josie? Jaden Joseph had a rip to left field. That yeah. kind of sparked our offense there a little bit. Uh, we weren't able to 
in that second game, get them across until later on, obviously, in that final yeah, we were 10th inning. We were flirting with some runs. All, yeah, we de- we were on the doorstep the whole game, and we just had didn't quite have the opportunity to get some things go our way. Um, but I think the biggest thing, especially from Friday to Saturday, um, was we were, we, were, we were able to limit the damage, and that was the biggest thing was whenever – uh, the pride would make uh, a move and try to get some offense going. And obviously it was a, a little bit of a, more of an offensive affair as opposed to the second game. Uh, we were able to limit them, right? We started off with five. Obviously they get four the next thing. We're able to bounce right back with three. We're able to establish the momentum. We were able to hold them in scoring position, not able to score, especially in those last couple innings to help us get the win. On Saturday, Parkside was really being the the role of the aggressor, especially offensively. And we were we weren't able uh, to really answer back, and that that just happens, of course, in this in the sport of softball altogether. Uh, obviously, being able to see a couple of players get in the lineup, especially over that weekend, back to backs are really hard to go through, and uh, obviously, mm-hmm. um, that was kind of a tough thing to kind of go through as far as personnel wise. Mackenzie Cleland was back on the mound; it was good to see that for sure. She obviously has had um, really a tough time with the injury bug for a while here, but she really had a pretty good start to the game. Uh, obviously, Parkside kind of got a roll in there later on in the game offensively. They started to warm up, especially in the fourth and the fifth, um, and then that kind of transitioned into the second game as well, but uh, I mean, overall, it was still a good weekend. I mean, obviously, Saturday, I mean, Joe, you were there. You got to see um, firsthand yeah. that whole effort, which was really cool to strike out cancer. Dr. Pink throwing out the first yeah. pitch. I that completely really cool. support that, and it was certainly just a cool event all the way around, and obviously, we'll be reflecting on that a little bit more in the game's results because obviously, we showed, uh, we saw I should say what this team can show on Friday uh, and obviously just didn't translate to Saturday, but that doesn't define the team going into this upcoming yeah, week. The big thing I think especially was we were able to get on base a good amount of times in this game with just walks, drawing a lot of uh, really good uh, opportunities at the plate and we were able to, you know, get some, get some momentum rolling. It's just Parkside just shut us down a lot. The tough part was Friday. That's how many stolen bases we had on the day. 12. Oh, yeah. A lot. 12. Guess how many we had Saturday? Not 12. Zero. Oh, we got thrown out three times wow. to steal because their catcher had an absolute cannon on her. But I think the that's a tough part, especially when you are such a a team that's so heavy with uh, stealing bases. And I mean, we were talking about that. That's kind of one of the big things that we have to do to be able to win games is get runners in scoring position. So that way we can score off of those singles. And then when you have a chance where you get a runner on base, especially with one, no outs or one out, and then all of a sudden get caught stealing two outs and that kind of throws it down. And then you're, you know, all of a sudden you're going to have the one, two, three inning right there. It's, it's always tough because, you know, it throws down a lot of, uh, momentum that you hopefully you can get, but then ended up not. So that was really the, that was really the unfortunate part in both games. Uh, Wisconsin parks. I just had, you know, two, two or three big innings that just really squandered a lot of the opportunities that we had. I mean, parks that first game, six runs, six runs in the top of the first, that's always tough to come back from. And then, uh, had a little bit stagnant for the, for game two, at least, or sorry, the game one, um, they go four, and but they got four and four runs in the fourth and the fifth inning. So it's not always the easiest thing, uh, with that, but, Regardless, great event is a great day, especially for uh, the cause we were trying to provide. So it was really cool to see. Yeah, and certainly a cool cause. And I think that's something that I love and certainly see other teams do that, um, especially which you guys can help too. upcoming Day for Dogs. You can uh-huh. support all the athletic programs as well as many academic dogs. programs uh, here coming on up Wednesday. on Wednesday. You can support the dogs. Support the Big dogs. Time. April, Big time. T- April 12th, all day. The link will be open. Send it to your friends, family to support the Bulldogs. Uh, you can support the track and field program. Yeah, dollar, two, you three, four, five program. thousand, ten thousand dollars. I mean, we ain't going to stop you from how much much you want to donate i mean there is no maximum so you can donate as much as you that want. that is true that is true so you're just saying but anyway moving forward i said track and field because i want to get to it a lot of good things a lot this of great things weekend down in oakland uh meat was ran very tell well us, brandon tell us brandon it was a very enjoyable weekend much better weather than kentucky Thank goodness. Uh, but it was definitely a great run meet, especially the fact of um everything's just really kind of flowed together it was a little bit late going on in the meet. I think we ended up finishing an hour um, hour later than scheduled, which obviously created a, a, a long drive home, but it was certainly worth it in the end, especially waiting on uh, for the second school record broken on the day. Donis does it again with a 5K, 1424, breaks his outdoor record by three seconds. He's not done yet. I'm calling it right now. Uh, really good race. I mean, especially he was with um, a guy named Drew Coolidge from Michigan Tech. They were really battling it out down the stretch, um, and Donis is able 
able to really put a, a aggressive move on at about two miles in. He was able to hold it the rest of the way, uh, which was super cool to see. And then obviously the other school record, uh, Whitney Farrell, freshman, first steeplechase ever, breaks the school record. Absolutely insane. Congrats to her. She's put in a lot of hard work, especially prepping for this meet. Um, And definitely to see that record finally go down is certainly well worth it. Um, That is certainly something that she can be proud of, Uh, especially in the first. I can't I can't emphasize more enough. The first time that you run steeple is the worst. And she got it in the first try. That's insane. It's the first try. Like that's it's crazy. Uh, it's just it's just a, a really cool feat, and I think that certainly uh, really puts to show the amount of work that her and as well as a lot of the distance people have put in um, all year long, especially practicing alongside of many of them. Um, and that was certainly cool. So uh, those two records obviously highlighted the day. A lot of great results. Uh, otherwise, I think my name was actually put up first in the recap. Don't know why I finished fifth, but I guess that's kind of cool. Uh, my steeple debut of the season. Uh, Kyle drew out also seventh uh, in the hammer throw. He said it was an all right performance. Obviously, he said he had more in the tank. So looking forward to seeing that uh, coming up in the next meet as well. Bryce George, first year shot putter, 13th and 18th in the discus. I believe discus, I believe was his debut as well. So really good solid performance thrown there from Bryce. Uh, Aaron Pierce was also 15th in the long jump. Uh, Andrew Shaffley, uh, 158 in the 800, a very windy 800, so very impressive time there, uh, as well as Brennan Kearney, 21st in the 5K, ran a really good time in that elite heat as well. Um, four by four was very fun. Um, it says Tyrese Beadle, Ethan Hamilton, Josiah Flora, and Kevin Wilson ran that race. Um, not to try to throw them under the bus, but it was not that lineup that actually ran the, the four by four. And I can tell you that because your boy somehow got roped into it. <laughs> so I was in the four by four. I would go, like, dude. I would like to claim now. And I asked coach Kelch about this and he can confirm. Uh, well, at least he confirmed at the time. I don't know if it's actually true. That I'm the craziest person enough to ever do the four by four steeple double in one day. So maybe we can find a per, uh, place in the record book for it. We don't actually have to, but I thought that was pretty hilarious. Cause I'm that crazy. That's probably true. Uh, as well as Dan Hardesty ran at about 15 minutes after his f- or his 1500, uh, which is a incredibly hard turnaround at the end of the day. So, uh, I mean, we were able to get down 53s for some couple distance boys. It's not too shabby, you know, that that's, bad, that's that not our bad. forte. So we were able to put the hammer down and show up a little bit. Uh, I'm pretty sure one of the Oakland hundred meter guys was in there. Uh, and he, cause I know because once I got the baton and I was right behind him, he took off like full sprint. You saying bolts down. I was like, Oh, <laughs> I'm going to catch this dude. If I just stay patient. And I did with about 150 to go, Let's go uh, which I believe that's that, what I see right there. Yeah. And I, high five. Yeah, there it is. Uh, which also I look later, Oakland did not finish. That's, uh, that, that, uh, relay team did not finish the race. So I guess we must have demoralized him enough that they just said, now we'll call it quits. We don't need to finish. I don't know how it works, but still a W in our book uh, at the end of the day. On the women's side, uh, obviously some really good performances. Brianna Copley uh, was runner up in the discus. Brisk is back at it again. Claudia Wilkinson, shout out on the show last week, finishing eighth in the high jump. A very good bounce back performance from her, especially um, in the duration of the high jump. They had to wait, it sounded like, for a lot because they combined flights together. Uh, if you're running a meet, that's not a good idea because they ended up, I believe, jumping for about two, two and a half hours at least. Uh, I can't confirm that. But every time I looked over, they were still jumping. I was like, are they going to stop jumping at any time soon? I don't know. Um, so it was really a, a, a real mental battle there for Claudia, and she did really well. Uh, Emma Stefan, eighth in the discus as well uh, as Rebecca Marvin, 10th in the shot put. Uh, Isabel Zadzio, 17th in the jab. Nia Tyron, 6th in the 400 hurdles, uh, which is a feature uh, or is a mark that she has put very well in the Midwest region, as you guys found on Wild Stat Wednesday. Shout out to those who like that post and everything. Uh, Sydney Kubiak, Lana Strauss, both PRs in the five or excuse, yeah in the five k um, in that elite heat. Daisy England, fourteenth in the eight hundred, as well as Michaela Roberts, I believe, ran a personal best as well in the four hundred, uh, and then the four by fourteen, finishing third overall. So very good performances all the way around. The meet was very solid. Uh, started off really cold. It's very windy getting alarmed, but it ended up being very nice by the end of the day. Very good racing conditions, really good competition. Uh, everything was put up. A lot of personal bests were hit this weekend. I know we can't mention all of them or we'd be here forever uh, and we wouldn't be able to get to the masters and stuff. Um, but there was certainly just a lot of really good mentally confident performances, which you're kind of looking for, for last weekend, but 
you know, the weather really had different ideas, I guess. So this made it a lot better. This is kind of the this first stepping stone we wanted last week, but now we got it in a good meet, and now we're going back to a good meet. Uh, there will be a group of us going down to the Bison Invite, Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, the location there. It's a really prestigious event down there in Bucknell, one that I've had in my uh, calendar circled for quite some time. It's one. It's got four steeple heats, Joe. Jeez. You know how rare it is to find one steeple heat to fit in a meet? <laughs> they four. have four because it's a, it is elite stuff. There will be distance events that start from two o'clock and won't finish till midnight. It is, it is that crazy. Jeez. There's multiple heats of the 10K. Yes, that's six miles on a track. There's multiple heats. There is that enough crazy people that run the 10K at this meet, but because there's standards and it's an elite meet and you come and show up for competition and we're really looking forward to doing that last year. Pretty solid performances. A lot of us, it was our first time. Now we're ready to put the hammer down. You're going to see some crazy times this weekend. I can already guarantee it. I'll knock on wood just to be safe, but it's going to happen. You can mark it down. It's going to be a fun meet in Pennsylvania. Just over across the way, a little 10 hour drive, but you know, it's going to be all worth it in the end of the day. So we're going to put down some fire times coming up. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Anyway, finishing out Fair State Sports Report. Tennis was in action tennis. over this last week. Uh, very solid performances all the way around. Uh, men's getting the win uh, over our rivals. In Allendale, Grand Valley, of course. Huge. Love that. Uh, women came out on the, the short end of the stick, but obviously put together. Um, some pretty good momentum going in, um, which was certainly good at the end of the day. Uh, but I mean, Grand Valley is a really good team. So I think that certainly um, the willingness to fight for the men, a 5-2 win, uh, certainly just showed that grittiness. Uh, obviously, the women fought really hard in that. Uh, Grain Valley, very, very good ranked team. So obviously, try to give it as much as they could. And they really did in a lot of these uh, games, a couple going to three, close, going right? to three sets. But and I mean, even if they didn't go to three sets, I mean, it was six, four, six, five, even extra points in each set. So they continued to fight, just couldn't quite get out on top. And that just happens at the at the end of the day. But uh, certainly some good results, I think, looking forward. And I think especially, I mean, this is really the start of the gauntlet. So um, this is kind of the, the, the big thing. This right is going to be the big momentum swing of the season because now we're going to have to uh, travel up north this weekend. Lake State, Michigan Tech coming up, uh, both on the road. So those are going to be a little bit of tough task this weekend, especially the back-to-back. That's a really hard uh, element to go through, especially within tennis overall. Um, so I think you're going to see um, some resiliency from this team. I think we've seen it already this season, but this will be the weekend that'll be the absolute staple coming up here for this tennis team. Yeah, and that's the thing too, especially when you look at Gleag standing so far. Michigan Tech for the men's is going to be a small one, but once again, I mean, especially when you saw the Davenport games last week, that was kind of a gap where, you know, you didn't want to overlook them because you had Grand Valley coming up and you didn't want to make it so that way you were really focused on, uh, you know, who you're playing next. Michigan Tech is not going to be any slouch of a team as Michigan Tech is also for the women uh, third in the GLIAC as well. So this one's going to be a pretty tough weekend. I feel like for both of these teams, just as, you know, keeping on the course, making sure you can get back to it uh, and, and playing really well is going to be the big thing because, I mean, if you overlook a team just by off the record, chances are you're probably going to lose to them regard, this, irregardless of how they are uh, on the court. Lake Superior State as well, near the bottom of the table for uh, men's and at the bottom of the table for the women's too. Yeah, confidence builder for sure against Lake State, and that'll be huge. Going to that Michigan Tech game, especially since it's their senior day, I believe, uh, on Saturday. So that'll be a challenge in of itself. We've got the Gleak tournament, man. And then it's Gleak tournament time. Where I'm, is the Gleak tournament? Is it you play host for one, right? Uh, I can't Somewhere remember. Like that. I can't remember exactly how that whole thing works in tennis because I know it's like Let us look a little here. bit different of a structure as opposed to the regular season when it comes Good to thing tournament play. the tournament pulled up. Good thing you do, Joe. He's on top of things it here is today. In Midland. It is or it. Or at least men's. Wait, Midland? Uh huh. But Northwood's not. In our conference, they anymore. both are well. What? April twenty one to twenty three, two thousand and twenty three, Midland Tennis Center, Midland, Michigan. It's just a neutral site. That's yeah. something I was not prepared. Yeah, for. I was also not prepared for that match. Number one, number one seed gets a buy. Number two seed gets a buy, and then it's four versus five, three versus six. Right. So in the standings right now, men's are good. They're looking at taking a day off on Friday. Yeah, you should be fine. Yep, and then obviously the women's will have to play their way into Saturday, but against some favorable competition either way right now with the, where they're at in the standings right now. Yeah. Um, you're looking at, I think right now we are currently seated, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, we're seated right now in sixth or fifth? 
For a women's? Yes, for women's. Uh, we are seated actually one, two, three. Seventh. Seventh. Oh, okay. So that would mean we're going to be um, right now looking at potentially playing um, the th- uh, the three seed. Am I right? No. If we're seventh, we top. That'll bottom be two, bottom two. Get knocked out. Bottom two. Wait, knocked out. There's six. There's. Six. Oh, I'm. Oh, yeah. my bad. I'm looking at an archive you thing here. Me. Okay, yeah, here we you, go. The top six in the conference go to the tournament. I got it. I got it now. So, okay, one by two by four v five, three v six. Okay, so we got to play our way in. Yeah, that, that makes so us even. These two weekend, these two games on this weekend here. If we win this, we just need we need to go over Saginaw right now. Mm-hmm. Saginaw is number six, and yeah. the tough part would be if Grand Valley keeps rolling, then we'd have to play them first round. If by chance we. Can, if Saginaw loses both of these and uh, we are able to get that weekend sweep, that would be huge. I'm trying to look up who Saginaw has to play this weekend. They play Wayne State uh, and Lake Superior State, I think. Oh, never mind. They already played them and they went one and one. So I don't know. We'd have to go. Oh. We have to sweep them because they don't have any more games until the exact tournament. Yeah, so. I think with the the women's team, then I think that actually might play. This is all a possibility. I think that plays actually in their favor. If we, better. Even if we split this, uh, maybe not because if we split this uh, weekend, Saginaw Valley would still have would still have beaten us. So then I think they would get the the bid in there. Right. So I'll sweep this weekend and we're in it. Yeah. So, I think that works better, and I think it's— A lot it's, of heavy altercations here. Yeah, you don't have to worry about where you're at in the standings. It's just you got to win to get in, and I think that's the best mentality to go into. Technically, we still have the same amount of—well, it's not technically. It is a fact. Uh, Michigan Tech has the same amount of wins as us with 7-7. Seven and seven. Yes. It's just we have more losses. Same sure. Thing. They just have not played as many. We've played five more games than this year. Right. Against a lot harder competition. So Right. So, they, I'm saying. so theoretically, Saturday's gonna be a dogfight to get in. Yeah. And right now, Tech is one spot above us. Yeah. And Tech has only played. I guess they've they've really only played some of the tough teams is Wayne because they've played Purdue, Davenport, and uh, Saginaw, and those are kind of middle of the table. So mm-hmm. they've played Wayne, who is seventeen and three on the year, and they lost to them. So. Yeah. So basically, if you're the women's team, you play to get in, and I think that's a good mentality. You got a really solid opportunity to. Yeah, I, like this, I, I this, think how this is going to shake out. Yeah, I think that's going to be uh, certainly uh, just a real tale to test. And I think right now, uh, in the position that we're in, I think this is a very winnable weekend. I think this could be certainly what this team needs, especially the momentum from last weekend, uh, coming into last weekend, I should say. Obviously not getting that to translate over into that Grand Valley game, but obviously they're number one uh, in the conference. They're one of the best in the nation for a reason. So it's going to be a really big dogfight. I think it's going to be fun. It'll be a doozy, Be man. on the lookout for this weekend. Epic proportions going down in tennis up in the UP. And that's going to do it. Fair State Sports Report. We will transition into the final part of the show. Masters Tournament. In the books, we covered it here last Thursday. Uh, Certainly some very notable uh, performances from that weekend. A lot of headlines as well. Obviously, with Tiger Woods not being able to finish the tournament due to some plantar fasciitis, uh, not able to walk the last part of that tournament, unfortunately. So he ended up having to drop out. Um, Our boy getting the victory. I didn't didn't think my call was going to work, but apparently it did. Run it, man. Prediction: Who do you think is going to win the whole thing, Brandon? No, oh, that's tough. I'm not going to pick Scotty Scheffler. I'm not going to be not going to be that guy, even though I think he's definitely uh, the guy to beat. I've looked back at a couple guys that I've picked in years past, and I kind of want to go back to some of them. Um, but I would say right now, um, I would look at a player like potentially John Rahm is my first kind of pick. I know that's kind of like, a, you know, yeah, go pick one of the top five players. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, but I think his game, I think – really has not necessarily represented how great he truly is the last couple of tournaments. Obviously, he hasn't been uh, in the winner's circle for a little bit. He's obviously gotten here and there, but not necessarily the consistency, especially that Scotty Shuffler's been put on. Yeah. Uh, but I think right now, the way that he's playing, I really like the round one scores that he's been putting up so far. Um, and I think it'll be very interesting to see where he ends up. Uh, yeah, I did. So it. basically, you're a you're a savant when it comes to choosing the Masters leaderboard. I'm Nostradamus. Yeah, this was a pretty wild ending. I feel like I wasn't really expecting the the top ten that we saw, uh, and especially where players ended up in the top ten uh, when we were making those predictions. I mean, Rom obviously getting um, 
top spot with minus 12 overall. Kepka had a little bit of a falling apart in that round three, uh, going 75 plus three on the day. I mean, Ron played just really solid. Mickelson and Spieth came out of nowhere. Tying for a second and then speed tying for fourth at minus sixth on the final round. And then Mickelson going minus seven on the final round at all it is wild when Mickelson actually has something to play for. Uh, and there's actually something on the line if he plays well instead of just getting uh, crazy, crazy checks each time just for um, being him. So that's just wild. Uh, and then Patrick Reed as well, tying fourth with. Uh, Henley going minus four for him and Henley going minus two. And then Hovland kind of fell apart near the end, going plus two on the day for the final round. But Scheffler um, making that top 10 spot with Shoffley and Morikawa uh, going minus four overall. Yeah, I think, I mean, we both had picks of top 10 guys. I mean, that's hard yeah. to that's hard to do considering there's going to be pretty much 50 in this entire field um, that will make it end up through in the whole tournament that you can pick from. And they're all really good players. But, uh, I think when you looked at this, uh, this tournament as a whole, obviously, um, you saw, you saw guys like Victor Hovland just get out in an absolute tear early on. Rom was right there with them. Uh, but I think the biggest thing too, was when you looked at Brooks Kepka going into that round, he was shooting well, he was getting a little, a little inconsistent in that third round. And then the fifth round, and he just couldn't get anything to fall. And that was the biggest thing is he could really never get out of that mental block. And obviously he was able to hold on to second. Uh, but I think just when it came down to John Rahm, um, he put himself in better positions than Brooks Kepka did. There's oh, yeah. no question about no, it. He no had the game plan that. really dialed up and he really stayed consistent, even though he had a little bit of that same type of vibe as Kepka. I mean, he was pretty much round one out red hot. Second round, a little bit back. Round three. In the positive mark at plus one on the round. And the difference was Kepka 75, Rom 69. That's the difference. Yeah. It's fourth round adjustments, able to stay with the game plan, not get too crazy away from it. Kepka played a little bit riskier down the stretch. Uh, not necessarily saying that it was more aggression, but just the way that he changed up his game plan. Obviously, in the lead by a couple strokes, obviously, you're going to play a little bit more naturally conservative than you might have if you're down four strokes. Um, but, I mean, especially you mentioned, Joe, I mean, Jordan Spieth, Phil Mickelson, that pairing together, absolute tear that final round, uh, seven down and six down, respectively, to get second and fourth. Uh, I mean, that was really the star. That was really kind of the, one of the big headlines, too, was how yeah. well they played and really put themselves in a position because a lot of those top guys just kind of really faded down the stretch. It almost makes you want to see yourself more on the chase card as opposed to a lead card uh, so when it comes saw, to some of these tournaments. You saw a lot of the kind of the guys who haven't really made a name for themselves yet. I mean, when you had Sahit Tagala going minus five on the whole tournament, getting that nine spot, so he gets the... A lot of these guys got the invite back, which is really solid. I mean, a lot of them, obviously, big names like Morikawa, Shoffley, Fitzpatrick, a lot of these guys, but, you know, you get... um you know, guys like Tom Kim from Korea, he was kind of a standout who really wasn't projected to do anything better than, like, top 15, maybe, and then for him to get all the way up to, I think it was, what, top 14? Top 16, something like that. Being able to kind of do a lot better than a lot of uh, expectations was really solid. I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a little bit uh, disappointed because with uh, Tiger's withdrawal before the fourth round, and with Jeff Knox's retiring from being the playing guy, uh, if people there's if there's a odd number, we weren't able to see him. And Keith Mitchell had to be all by himself uh, at that 2:24 tee time. But unfortunately, there was. I feel like they did a really good job with uh, setting up this round four or after the cut. Uh, these tee times pairing up guys who are really close to each other and who are going to have really solid one-on-one -on -one battles as well. I mean, Scotty Scheffler played with Matt Fitzpatrick at that 127 tee time. That was a really solid showing there. The Mickelson and Spieth, who were just going at it and really feeding off each other that whole fourth round, that was a solid tee time because, I mean, for them to be able to feed off each other, I think is that that's one of the main reasons why they were able to jump up so far in that scorecard and play so well on that final day, which was really cool to see. But again, I love the Masters. One of the best years that we've had it so far. Always really cool to see some of these storylines go through. I mean, with, I mean, Live Golf just made it even crazier with just that storyline with Compe you know, competitiveness. Competitiveness, these guys battling out, but also with Sam Bennett, that storyline with him being the amateur. Oh, yeah. uh, having such a standout day the first day was really cool. And as well to see, you know, Brooks, Brooks Kepka have the kind of like that 
Really solid show out. Ronald come from behind and being able to play really well that final day. Really, really solid Masters, and it's been one that's been able to shape up with a lot of these past couple of years for sure. Yeah, I think it made it intriguing, too. We had a couple big names that weren't even in the final rounds. Like McElroy. Bry- Bryson Shambo. You mentioned Rory McIlroy. Kevin Kisner, your boy, didn't quite make it. Um, as well as just a couple other really good players, Sergio Garcia, who's been in the in the hunt for a lot of years, and then obviously the withdrawals like Will Salatoris, Tiger Woods, who's tasing Kevin Na. So that kind of made it unfortunate when you think about it. Um, but I mean, you still saw a really. I'm thinking you saw a really good tournament. Obviously, a little bit of a chaotic one as they were only yeah. get only able to get one full round in on Thursday. Everything else was oh, broken yeah, was up and split trees, out. So the trees falling down and just the whole weather. Did we talk go- about that Thursday? I don't think we did because it only it happened on Friday. So <laughs> oh, yeah, it, I get my days mixed up. Yeah, the, all those pines going down was certainly a little scary. But that just shows that you know what Augusta is. It is crazy. It does seem mythical and magical, but it is just another place. Trees do fall there and the grass still does grow. So uh, I think that kind of really brought the different elements to it. And you saw a lot of these, uh, you saw a lot of these really resilient guys um, that were really able to, you know, pull the zipper up as I keep getting <laughs> finicky here, uh, closing out the show. But I, they were able to pull the zipper up in the rain, in the elements, and they were still able to get back to their game. And I think that's how a lot of these guys, especially the leaders, were able to get back and uh, really saddle up, especially to make those adjustments going into that first part to finish the round and then continuing that hot streak into the second round, even though there's a break in between. So I thought that was really good. I think that I, this tournament overall was a very good success. And I think the, the, the prestige of the Masters lives on at Augusta and I'm I want to try to get there myself. I saw a couple a uh, couple people yeah. that went there, especially <laughs> I think uh, heard the be, stories. Oh my yeah, gosh. Cool. I, I that's bucket list. Bucket list for Hands sure to down. be able to go. Especially hearing you know from Harrison. He went that was really cool Shout to out. hear the stories. Shout out Harrison, shameless plug for him. Uh there was just a lot of cool things I heard about that place. And I think the one cool thing about it is like especially with like social media, you're able to see a lot more of like what makes that place so special because before it was kind of word of mouth and like you kind of were just like you missed out on certain aspects or whatever. But I mean, with social media, seeing so many videos, like you see like how efficient everything is there when managing a tournament with so many patrons going there. And then you also see how efficient everything is just with managing that course, how much money they're making out that tournament is so cool. And to be able to experience that would just be just bonkers. Top notch. I definitely, definitely got to go on the lottery to get tickets there for sure. Uh, yeah. Hopefully you can win the lottery. I'm excited to try to get down to me and my dad were talking about going to Rocket Mortgage. So that would be certainly cool. Oh, to yeah. Get they're down there. Detroit. Just, to see, sick, yeah. just to see a couple of those guys and how they play. Waste Management Classic. Keep, oh, how sick yeah. That would be. Oh, yeah. 16th. Oh, just 16th running start. Wild and rowdy. Oh, my gosh. One of the greatest, I, craziest holes in golf. If right I there. was ever a professional golfer and I played at the Waste Management Classic, you know what I would do? Joel Damon, shirt up. Well, that, with, for uh, sure. <laughs> that for sure. I would go wild, but I would keep like, I mean, you're a professional golfer, so you got a crazy amount of money. I would say I would keep like five grand in like my, uh, like in cash in my, uh, what's it called? Bag. Sure. And then I just Your be golf like, bag? Yeah. in my golf bag and I just hand out like a hundred dollar bills, be like beer on me, go get a beer or something like that. That would be like, so like, that would be like total boss move. I feel like you'd be the people's champion. I would be the people. That's my, that. I want to be the people's champion, man. I want to be that. Joe wants Drop the people's elbow. But he dropped the people's elbow. <laughs> Not you, <your> man. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, we have enough jokes. That would be, dude. I, oh my gosh, we could go. Could you imagine like how much publicity you'd get, like just off of like all the sports accounts being like, yeah, he was handing out hundred dollar bills for people to go buy stuff from the concessions. Oh yeah, you would be the you'd be the favorite instantly the new favorite so it's going to be a fun tournament next year there's no doubt about it and i'm really the rest of the the fedex cup season as well so it's going to be a really fun tournament uh coming up with uh i think um well, we got rocket mortgage is coming up here later on um but i think it's still going to be i mean right now you look at the fedex cup standings and you're seeing a lot of familiar familiar names up there um, as far as this field. So right now, John Rahm's probably going to be the next guy to get up there, especially uh-huh. with the Masters win um, right now to overtake Scotty Shuffler. Um, but Max Holm has been sneaky playing well too. So right now, you're looking at a lot of those guys. Roy McIlroy, he'll for sure bounce back. You see a lot of these other guys as well, mm-hmm. like Tony Finau, as well as Colin Morikawa down there a little bit. Um, Justin Rose has really kind of been uh, putting it together with his one win on the season. Uh, but 
it'll be very interesting to say the least as well. And it's going to be a much different leaderboard now with, uh, you know, some people gone over on a different tour over across the pond. I was going to say, yeah, we got RBC Heritage coming up at the end of this week. Uh, $20 million purse for that one. So quite the payout. But yeah, as well as the Mexico Championship, Wells Fargo Championship following that, another $20 million purse. Uh, and then the PGA Championship closing out uh, in mid-May. So that one's going to be pretty wild. $15 million purse for that as well. That's bonkers to think about. Yeah. Sheesh. Golf is a paying sport. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I might need to pick up the clubs gotta, full hey, time we, now. You I just don't gotta, know. Once you make the once you make the cut, it's like you make. Let me look that up real quick. How much? How much was last place for the Masters? Yeah, well, I don't want to see. I do sometimes. Whenever I have a little pet peeve of mine, whenever I look up <laughs> stuff on on the internet, it's like. I word the question well. Just tell me it. I don't even have to like click through like four different websites to figure this out. Because the runner-up got a purse, got a winnings of one point six two, and then third place got a winnings of one million. Wow! Here we go. This is this what we need. Fiftieth place got thirty seven thousand dollars. What? Yeah. Fiftieth. Fiftieth place. What? So quite the difference. But once if you, uh, thirtieth place was the last one to get six figures. Thirtieth. 30th, one hundred two thousand. So after tax is about fifty thousand. Fifty, what? Are you trying to put on I'm trying to hit the button. <laughs> I, yeah. I was there. We go. Yeah, just switched the little this thing. Yeah. Dumb touch screen. But, We're in shambles now. We probably yeah. should get to the end of the show here. But no, Dude, that is that is crazy. So, that's so much money. That's that like I was what, talking how, to my buddy about. All you have to do is win a, a major tournament, just one. Have four days of your best golf. Fine. Win one tournament, you're good for four years. That's how it works. Yeah, that's really all it is. Like you win a three and a half million dollar purse, yeah, seven to under eight hundred thousand dollars a year. I think you'll be just fine. That's more than what doctors are making, believe it or not. But the industry definitely has gotten the money moves, and it certainly will continue to do so. Thank you all for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe on WBRN as well as all of our podcasting and YouTube platforms, social media as well at the MBSP. And I guess we'll see you on Thursday. But until then, take care, everybody. 